Hello and welcome to What We Are Watching. This is Catherine. And I'm Ed. And John. Okay, so I guess I'll start because, you know, whatever. You must start this episode, Catherine. It's Wait, required. no, I don't want to. Okay, so I finished watching, I mean, finished watching, that sounds silly because it's a movie, The Gray Man, the Ooh, new Ryan okay. Gosling. Super new one. Yeah, okay, so it was in theaters for a little bit. It's the new Ryan Gosling action movie. I like that you try to phrase that it's the Ryan Gosling because that's that's your main focus. It's the new Russo Brothers movie. Thank you, everyone. It's and Russo Chris Brothers. Evans. I know. but <laughs> oh, I, So we all have different tacks on Yeah, screen. I guess. I feel like <laughs> it's obviously Ryan Gosling is like the main dude. He's like, you know, for lack of a better term, he's the James Bond or the Jason Bourne or whatever it is in this, you know, movie. Does I, his character have a J and a B in his name? Jason uh, Bourne, James Bond, Jimmy Blank. No, no. He, his name is Six, the number six. So, I mean, I guess he does have a name, but I don't know what it was. He's just Six. So, it's Ryan Gosling, Anna de Armas, Chris Evans, and Reggae Jean Page. Those are the main heavy hitters of the story. I can't believe you guys haven't watched it, because obviously in theaters, but now on Netflix, which is how I, you know, I got mean, to see it. It is very recent. Uh, well, yeah, but also but it seems right up your alley. It totally is right up our alley, but it's right up our joint watching alley, which is oh. it's real slow. Like when you can, when it comes to like couple joint watching, the brother joint watching, psh, man, it takes a lot longer on that tack. Even slower. Like Tuesdays and Fridays. Oh, okay. And we had shows already on deck for those, so this is definitely a probably this weekend so not in time for this podcast dang it dang it well you'll have to give me an update after what sure. you thought of it okay so here's my vibe take on it yes you're right it's the russo brothers so it's super actiony and i don't really yeah. yeah i don't even really see the marvel movies so i'm not even really aware of like the level of their action stuff so this was like oh this is this is a lot of action well, and it's fully, I mean, this is basically the writers, uh, Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. That's how, like, the Russo Brothers came in. Not, I'm saying, a personal relationship, but these writers wrote all three Captain Americas, of which the Russo Brothers started at number two. Oh. And then they also wrote Thor Dark World and those last two Avengers, so... They're all up in it together. They're all up in it. But then they wanted to do something else. They're exploding things. Yeah. I was like, well, this is not superheroes because <laughs> it's spies, basically. You know, it's CIA operatives or whatever. I think the funnest element is that Chris Evans is playing a real jerk. He's <laughs> he's like a, a psychopath, torturer type of, you know, off the reservation, not actually working for the CIA, and he's up to what? no good. He's real fun, though. I don't like that. I like my Chris Evans uh, smarmy, but like good guy. No, it, this is smarmy bad guy. <laughs> this is um, real bad guy. By the way, very important, 40 seconds ago, you almost uh, did the song from Drive, Ryan Gosling's movie, because he's a real... Human being. What? What anyway, are you talking about? Back to whatever you were talking about. <laughs> I have no idea what that reference is. Uh, so Ryan Gosling, very fun, kind of dry performance, like in terms of his character's real sort of deadpan and you know low energy. He's in his hey girl mode. What's that? Oh, it's uh, you know when he's like, hey girl, <laughs> need help with that sweater. <laughs> you know, he's very quiet, but also is getting the whole scene, yeah, scene work yeah, done. That's okay. what he's doing. And a lot of fighting. So it was really enjoyable. And it's kind of long. It's like a two plus hour endeavor, which, you know, all right, sure. And then there's a lot of things breaking and exploding and getting shot up, including their in multiple European locations, which look legit. I don't know. I mean, maybe they weren't, but they seemed like they were really in Europe or wherever, including a very long sequence in a castle. So that was fun. All right. Anna de Armas is great. She's playing also a spy and gets kind of roped into... Wait, his, James what, Bond oh. crossover. 
<laughs> well, not only well, James Bond crossover, because I was also thinking Knives Out crossover, because she and Chris Evans have worked before on... This is yeah. a tangled world that yeah. they're in. This yeah. is a, I mean, is this a multiverse? <laughs> Except we're saying it's one universe, so it's not. Well, yeah. Uh, Reggae John Page, I don't think he has any crossover stuff with them, but I, I could be wrong. I don't know. He's also playing kind of a bad guy, so that's so, fun. You know what? He probably time-traveled from his Bridgerton Yeah, time. he, he yeah. took a break from Bridgerton to do this, but then, from you know... The, uh, the Bridgerton Wars? Yeah. The Bridger- <laughs> anyway, so very enjoyable. I liked it a lot, and um, I would uh, like to hear what you guys think after you say it, you know, soon. So, just to clarify, did you think the gray man was great? Oh, yeah. Uh, the gray man was great. great. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is I Love That For You, which is a Showtime show that stars Vanessa Bayer from Saturday Night Live. Oh, right, right, sure. And also Molly Shannon from Saturday Night Live. And it's set at a, what do you call those, like a shopping channel or a shopping network? Like, not home shopping, because that it's a fake made-up one. But it's like a televised... Uh, yes, like a home shopping on your TV, you know, whatever. Like an as-seen-on-TV right. type. Thing. Yeah, so there's a bunch of actors who play the salespeople, and they are amazing and hilarious. The whole world of it really cracks me up. I mean, that's like a funny place to set this because it's really serious, but also like really wacky, mm. like just trying to sell weird blankets and other weird stuff. It's very funny. And then the overall boss of the channel is this actress, Jennifer Lewis, who I'm sure people would recognize. I don't know what I know her from, but I just know her. She's this gorgeous older black woman, older being like, I don't know, maybe 60-ish. And she's very serious and she's in charge of this network and don't mess with her. So the basic premise is that Vanessa Bayer, when she was a young girl, had childhood leukemia and has always been a huge fan of this particular shopping network and also Molly Shannon as a salesperson, was very aware of her and now as an adult has gotten herself into a position to try and get a job there. And amazingly, it goes pretty well and then very quickly goes very badly. Oh, no. (laughs) And then... In a weird, this is in the promos and in the first episode, so it's not a spoiler. It's part of the core, you know, story. Premise of the show, yeah. Is she tries to get herself from being fired by saying, you can't fire me. I have cancer. And which is a very weird move. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's one, it's a lie. And two, she is trying to fix that she's done a terrible job on air and she's trying to say that like I can get people interested in me because I have this sob story and you can't fire me because I'm ill she doesn't really say like because then I would sue you but there maybe that's a little bit of the uh, vibe not, not exactly implied that it would be in poor taste right so they do let her continue and then weirdly she does a really good job and there's all sorts of inside, you know, politics at the workplace mm-hmm. where people sure, sure, like sure. her, people hate her, people like whatever. And of course, she's very conflicted because she's lying. And then the boss gets this really good idea that they're going to capitalize on this cancer situation, of which course. is another complication. Anyway, it's very fun. It's pretty short. It's eight episodes and it's on Showtime. So hopefully Showtime on demand or uh, if you have the Hulu premium service where you can watch your Showtime through Hulu or whatever that is. Anyway, I really liked it. I thought it was very fun. I really liked one of the characters, Darcy, played by Matt Rogers. He was fantastic. And uh, again, I already mentioned Jennifer Lewis, the boss. She is great. And then Arden Marai, she plays uh, Beth Ann. She is also great. It's really fun. The cast is great, and I just really enjoyed it. So it's a shorty, but it was very fun. Okay, that's right. me. I'm not trying to extend your uh, segment on this. You seem like you've wrapped it up. But I did want to ask, are there some cool cameos? Because I'm seeing some guest stars towards the bottom of my IMDb. That well, I... there's a very funny Ryan Phillippe That's one. That, well, Ryan Phillippe and Jason Schwartzman <laughs> were, my, were my two questions. Where did they come they, in? They were good. All okay. Right. So, I, well, I, I'm debating whether or not to divulge. Ryan Phillippe 
It's very funny. It's kind of near the end. Jason Schwartzman is a blind date near the beginning, and that is also very dumb and funny. Great. Okay, okay so good. there you go. Okay, so Ed, you want to go next? Uh, sure. I uh, am bringing similar awesomeness to the podcast today. I watched a fresh, brand new uh, young kids movie called One Up, uh, which is on Amazon Prime. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to be as amazing as uh, Mythic Quest, which John and I watched together on Apple TV. And that's like from some of the guys from uh, Sunny in Philadelphia. And overall, that series between the two seasons, like they really leaned into the creation of the game. So you get to see a lot of like really cool graphics and stuff as they were, well, not all cool graphics in that show. Uh, in this movie, One Up, it's a college athlete esports movie. So I'm, oh, I'm partly okay. watching it because it's a college movie. I'm like, cool, college movie sports movie that's great you updated it let's see what you're doing um and the premise of this is that it was uh you know some scholarship issue where uh that person's got to figure it out they make a move they do an all girls esports team which of course you know flies in the face of all college athletics that your team leader has now got a competition mm-hmm. so classic college sports rivalry stuff and then there's a love interest. Got to have the love interest in the movie, of course. So there's, I've not really known almost anyone except uh, Ruby Rose, who plays like the coach of the team. And, Got it. Uh, is the more senior experienced person because she used to design games and now is teaching the class. And suddenly there's a team that needs a coach. Guess who they go to? <laughs> the previous experienced person in that field. Okay, great. Um, but everybody else was uh, pretty young, pretty new. Had never seen them in much before, so I didn't really track uh, any of the actors coming into it. And overall, it was fun, so I, I'm too old to be trying to track down these 20-year-olds' careers and see what they're doing. It's great. You got into a movie? I'm happy for you. Go for it. It is for video games. Good luck on the next one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, It felt very small compared to other like college football level movies where like there's a big stadium that you're showing off and there's something that you have to buy into in a feature where the athleticism or the sport that they're playing i don't really play but i never played football but i've watched football and i've watched people play video games so i think i can figure out how to be on the team of this one I'll tell you, uh, not playing video games, it was hard to watch the actual gameplay. Like, as a non-online role-playing game or, you know, team attack game or stuff that Eric does on, mm -hmm. like, PUBG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, from the viewer's perspective, I wasn't really tracking the back of all the characters' heads from the front of their heads. Like, when you're showing me the main character and the game character that they're playing, it's a profile picture. And it's their faces. And then when you're watching the gameplay, it's the backs of all their heads. That was a challenging. But they, <laughs> if they won, you're like, they, 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 that, they won. That thing blew up, and it was the right team. Great. I'll Great. figure it out eventually. I yeah. knew my team mm -hmm. would win this round. Um, yeah, and so then, you know, there's a big battle at the end. they got to come up against their their nemesis and Nemesis? Uh, whatever. Is it's fine. That a, it's not even part of make the that up? I don't know. Whatever, it's all good. They eventually are successful. And I don't think there'll be a sequel to Up. <laughs> <laughs> but there should be because they're all freshmen and they got like three more years of college in esports to go. So let's we make, let's do one it. up, two Spin up, us three up, four up. Come on. <laughs> Extra lives. It's the TV series version. <laughs> yeah, the world tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's not a strong recommend, but it was also probably off of everyone's radar. So even that it's getting a recommend, pretty good review for them, I think, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, John. All right. Well, do I first need to make the new girl connection to what you were talking about? Um, yes, yes, of course. Okay. So in that, I love that for you. Um, that TV show you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You had said that actress Aiden Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, it was funny when I looked her up. I was like, oh, right. The sister of Nassim Padrad in New Girl. Oh. Which never fully made sense to me because guess who was also a producer on New Girl? Her actual sister, Nina Padrad, who did act in other things. I don't know why they didn't just hire her. It's crazy. That is crazy. It's one of my new girl conundrums that I will never let go of. Anyway, now we can talk about the show that I apparently am going to talk about. Okay, go for it. Own. All right. So I, you know, came around, whatever, a month or two late. It was The Offer on Paramount+. Plus. Oh. So, look, I'm not the biggest Godfather fan. I mean... It might be sacrilege, but maybe my favorite part about The Godfather 
is that Tom Hanks is such a big fan of it, and you've got mail, and it's what? one of the storylines. Yeah. I didn't know that at all. What? I don't yeah. remember that. Some of the major plot points of The Godfather, I know because of Tom Hanks in You've Got Mail. Because he's wow, bringing his crazy. actresses. I didn't know about that. That's great. Now I don't have to watch the movie. He's bringing his business expertise as a <laughs> big box bookseller secretly to this small bookseller who he's competing against, but she doesn't know. She doesn't well, know. I definitely know the premise of You've Got Mail, but Good. I don't know the connection or use of The well, Godfather in it. business expertise that he's passing along. Is yeah, that, well, what should, I, what should I do with anyway. this, this, this company that's trying to me, run me out of business? Take him to the mattresses. Take him to the mattresses. It's a very funny exchange. Yeah. Thank you, Nora. Efren, we love you. Yeah. Anyway, so look, I do like The Godfather. Sure. Um, so this is interesting because what it ends up being is, you know, and there are many not oblique clues, but, you know, uh, not obvious of how something happened in real life that it would end up in the script. Like, okay, they're naming it The Offer. Like the offer you can't refuse from the movie. Okay, got it. That kind of that kind of thing happens a lot in the actual show of like, oh, well, but mate, but that they're saying that, but like, didn't they already write the script or like, how would that have then like, oh, it's just life imitating art for these people? What's going on? But anyway, it's quite fun and it's not truly based on a book or anything. So it is kind of the you know the television memoir of the producer. Albert Ruddy. So part of the problem is you don't have a backup to like, oh, okay, well, what is the adaptation? Oh, I can I can go read that and like, oh, what do they change, not change, that kind of thing. And then also, definitely it's from his viewpoint to a degree. You have things that are like, well, I mean, is that really how it happened? Or is that how it happened from your perspective? Or is that now being shortened for television? There's quite a few of those. Um, and But on the other hand, hard to figure out some of them. It's an amazing story. I mean, I, you know, look, I don't know if every, you know, best movie of all time has kind of a crazy story because making a film is crazy. You know, getting all those people together and you know. so many things have to line up. Yes. And I mean, but when, it might help a lot if you have a producer who's completely off and doesn't remember it great. And then it's way more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we're not saying we know oh, that. No, no, for we're a not fact, saying that. Okay. okay. Sure. That's not what we're talking Wait, about. Wait, so yes. the main character, that that's the producer, is that yes. Miles Teller? Yes. Okay. You know, look, I love Miles Teller because everyone, including Catherine, loves Whiplash. Um, no. Oh, God. Don't <laughs> even bring up Whiplash. Okay. Rooster from Top Gun. I mean, come Rooster. on. This guy's all over the place. He's perfect. Um, but look, I did really like him in, what was that movie I just saw? Spider... Spiderhead. Spiderhead. Yeah, I just I liked him in that a lot. So he's fantastic. Teller twenty two. He's all it's, over this year. Yeah. Well, those delayed releases really uh, come coming for us. Yeah. So he's fantastic as always. He's doing, you know, as he always does, a slight, you know, because sometimes he's doing a, the the normal Miles Teller talking a mile a minute kind of whatever thing. This is a, a slightly different flavor of this because look, you're talking about a different time period. So you're we're taking it back to like the seventies, early seventy, and then. You're you're also all the people in the movie are or making the movie aren't in the mob but then somehow the mob gets involved in various places uh because you know i i didn't really realize that the book was such a bestseller and such a cultural phenomenon that the mario puzo yes, actual yeah, godfather yeah. book mm -hmm. uh and so it you know the mob took an interest i mean according to the show i i need to do more, there's always more research but according to the show, both the mob and Frank Sinatra, who was slightly connected to the mob, mm -hmm. took an interest because there's also a singer character that was maybe more of a big deal in the book. And that was like rumored. Everybody thought at the time, like it was based on Frank Sinatra. Right? It was based on, and it was, that was like a negative thing. So Frank did not like that. Mm. So yeah, Frank didn't have control over it. He was not a fan. Yeah. So as the, you know, Miles Teller, as this producer, there's, it's, it's a little bit of a different Miles Teller, but I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, you also had Matthew Good. I mean, this is, we buried the lead here because it's Robert Evans. It's Bob Evans, the producer. Right, right, right. right, right, right. Uh, head of Paramount at the time. You know, they present him as giving him kind of a shot out of nowhere, Albert Ruddy, the producer. It's, uh, you know, look, he'd, he had co-created and left Hogan's Heroes. He'd also written on another television show, which they don't mention here. And they talk about his, the first movie he did with Robert Redford. Uh, we get a great Billy Magnuson cameo as Robert Redford. It's fantastic. You barely even see his face. It's the best. <laughs> um, they what don't, movie was that? It's a motorcycle movie you've never heard of. Okay, perfect. Um, and then he actually did another movie as well, but we don't mention that. 
Uh, so not nobody. It is. Yeah. It is. You know, it's interesting because when you're watching this, it's ten episodes, it feels not long, but like they go through so much. You see the twists and turns. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're going, you know, minute by minute, and there's a lot apparently that happened it's crazy (laughs) so anyway but you so much of this stuff you feel like you're with these like hollywood up-and-comer types but actually a lot of them are established so robert evans very established you know he's talking about some of the other projects he's doing you know it's with very established people whereas yes albert ruddy not on that same level but you know they kind of it's interesting the way they because Francis Ford Coppola was also not quite, you know, the star that he became, you know, from Godfather and after. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I, I would I would wonder what their thought of this project was actually going to be. Like how big they, I can't imagine they thought it was going to be as big as it actually was. And then forever. Load, loading yeah. it the way they did, considering how they could have loaded it. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe you didn't have this backed up very much. Too bad, though, because it was awesome. By the way, Courtney I'm going to talk about this for the entire length of 10 episodes right now. <laughs> it's There's so much. It's so crazy. <laughs> so just to comment on what you're saying, right, it's part of the what they presented in the TV show was, okay, yes, best-selling book of the decade. However, we're not going to give it the biggest budget because Paramount is struggling and, you know, Bob Evans is trying to wheel and deal, but his parent company of Paramount, Gulf and Western, which is, you know, you have two people playing it. Colin Hanks is playing kind of a composite character, apparently. And then you have Byrne Goodman, who's playing the actual Charles Bluthorn, who was, you know, was the Gulf and Western CEO. But they're really kind of crunching on Paramount. And so, therefore, they only gave them $4 million to make Godfather, which at the time was, I i don't know, maybe a high B-type budget or something. It was it was low. So right. they were, so a lot of these choices were kind of like, oh, well, what if we don't go with, uh, you know, stars or whatever? So, like, even Marlon Brando, all the actors ended up working for scale or something. It was kind of madness. So... I think, yes, even though they had this hot property, they then didn't give it a lot of money. So Classic Hollywood move. Introduced- and you know what's the best successful feature that you did that entire year slash decade? The one you put the least effort into. Good job. Which, Good job. It, it worked out great for them because, I mean, they really, between... I mean, they didn't exactly know that Francis Ford Coppola was going to end up being fantastic. You know, they didn't know that they were going to get Marlon Brando. Apparently, at that time, you know, he was sort of not past his peak, but he was had already plateaued at the peak and was now getting the reputation of like, oh, extremely hard to work with. And like, but don't even, why even approach him? You know, and he's not, he's not the absolute hottest. Like, oh, he just had a hit movie last year. He'd had a couple flops. So it's like, no, 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 no Marlon Brando. Oh, that's going to work out great. Uh, Where was this relative to Apocalypse Now? Was it after? Is that sort of what Francis Ford Coppola had the cachet and from, and then also the relationship with Marlon Brando? So, absolutely not. Apocalypse ah. Now is seven years later. What? This ends up coming out in uh, 1972. Apocalypse Now doesn't come out till 1979. So, this was part of, like, you know, Francis Ford Coppola kind of ascending to the stars and then absolutely being a star. Although, you know, the, the troubles of Godfather, the production, I think, got kind of eclipsed by how it ended up being dealt with, whereas the troubles of Apocalypse Now are still, you know, sort of part and parcel. Uh, of the genius and terribleness of the project or something. Mm -hmm. That would almost be too distracting of a story to have like the version of the offer, but do that version of Apocalypse Now, Explosion or whatever you'd call that one. Woo! No, it would, I mean, look, it would be, it would be great. It'd be interesting. Look, I think there are quite a few, I I don't think there are television shows and movies about making The Godfather, but I think there's stuff, there's lots of, people are very interested. There's all kinds, I think there are books, there's, there's stuff about The Godfather. But the, you know, this was that interesting wrinkle of like, oh, the producer who hadn't shared it, who actually was in from almost the ground floor. And then the, it's it, this is one of those things that you feel like is really from his viewpoint, because then he decides not to produce Godfather 2, even though everybody's in, you know, they have the success. So now Bob Evans, Marlon Brando, Francis Ford Coppola, the author who it was, you know, crazy that he even got to co-write the first script is coming back. Everybody's back. Albert Ruddy says, no. No. Okay. It's, wow. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of wild. So they really try to present it as like, no, 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 this is really what he thought, and this is why he made that decision. And you're like, 
that cannot be the entire story. But that's, <laughs> that's a, a good spin, though. I mean, a, if, if it's in your control to spin it, then you're going to put the best on it. Yeah, it's a positive spin. He goes on to do The Longest Yard, which he had done like a treatment and story of. He didn't write the script, but because um, he created Hogan's Heroes and that first TV show he had written on. So like there's he was not a writer, but the little he, he did. He was he was used to a prison. Mm. He needed to get back to his roots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he uh, he then had a long history with Burt Reynolds, and because he then he did Cannonball Run with him, he wrote Cannonball Run too. What? Um, okay. So look, he he has an interesting career. I mean, you know, you could argue that Godfather is definitely kind of the most important movie that he did. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so that choice to not do Godfather two. Because you know that there's some things that you're like, okay, we're doing this all about Godfather 1. So there's got to be kind of a difference going into Godfather 2. Not having done, you know, or known everything about this already, I didn't know that was coming. So it's an interesting choice, but it really defines what the series is about to a degree, especially by the end. So there's also a ton of other great people involved. The person who co-created and, you know, did a lot of the writing with this guy, Michael Tolkien, he had written the novel and... Uh, like Mario Puzo, then did the script for the player, so very Hollywood, you know, as yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you had these uh, ten episodes before directors. I'll say the directors, and I'll say this about the episodes. But you had um, Colin Buxey, Gwyneth Hoder Pouton, and then you have Adam Arkin, which I never, I don't know, fully absorbed. Oh. Son of Alan Arkin, yeah, and directs okay. a ton of TV. Mm-hmm. Didn't really get that. And then Dexter Fletcher, who's done Rocket Man and uh, who helped out at the end of um, Bohemian Rhapsody a couple years ago. Oh, interesting. So really talented people. So we've mentioned two of the actors. You also have Juno Temple, does a fantastic job as always. Oh, cool. And then Matthew Good as Bob Evans. I mean, I really enjoyed him. You you might not think it'd be up his alley. But I swear. Yeah, I is, wouldn't have pictured him, so that's surprising. It, but. He does such a good job. I don't know what the deal is. It just works so well. I mean, he's very talented. We knew that. Sure. But he's not being English, so this is strange. <laughs> so fantastic. Colin Hanks did quite a good job. On the mob side, we had Giovanni Ribisi as just a very classic kind of, <laughs> well, he does have a little, there's a tiny bit of new school mobster to him, but otherwise, mm-hmm. you know, classic looking and acting. And you want to not like it, but you just, you're like, no. It works. It, you're doing a good job. Okay, this good. Is good. Um, you also get Justin Chambers from Grey's Anatomy as Marlon Brando. Now, when you first see him, I definitely was like, but what? This is crazy town. And then it almost worked better because they kind of were trying to present Marlon as like, oh, what's Marlon's deal? This is crazy. But then when he acts, he's amazing. And it was once you saw a little bit of this transformation, because they did a couple interesting things, you didn't get to see a lot of acting, but there were a couple moments that were like acting or whatever, and that really was like, oh, actually, your Marlon Brando life portrait is great. I This is really adding a lot for me. Mm. And the guy who did Al Pacino, because Al Pacino, I guess, had really only done stage at that point, and was maybe not Bob Evans, who he would want to put in that role. He wanted to put basically a movie star in there. Like, mm-hmm. no, no, let's chalk this full of movie stars. So you have... Uh, Even though our budget is real low. Like, how's that going to work? We'll just tell him to work for scale. I'm Bob Evans. You'll work for scale. Mm, yeah, apparently. Okay. I mean, that's kind of how it worked. But this guy, Anthony Ippolito, as Al Pacino, I thought did a fantastic job. I mean, you could argue nice. it was caricature, but it, I don't know. I thought it really worked. It was quite good. Also, the guy, Patrick Gallo, who does Mario Puzo, this is one for me, like, you know, he's done other stuff, but I haven't really seen him. And now this is, this is like going to be what I see in my mind for you forever. This is, yeah. It's this is just, <laughs> cemented. Yeah. Is this not you? Are you not Mario Puzo in the 70s? I don't understand. And also, you know, not to forget, but Dan Fogler as Francis Ford Coppola. I do love him. He, yeah. you, again, you would think, you know, oh, maybe that's not going to work. Too comic, too whatever. No, it really, it really does work. He can be serious. Yes, I mean, he, he does a lot of good comedy work, but he can be serious for sure. I mean, he's your favorite muggle, but yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> it really worked. I, I really enjoyed it. And I mean, it was, you know, that's one of those things where you wonder like, okay, this is from this other guy's perspective. So are we being unfair or is this inaccurate of Francis Ford Coppola? But it's a fun thing to watch, whether it's right or wrong. So I I wish I could tell you that it was right or wrong or how, but I can't. (laughs) I have have one question for you. Yes. Just so you can inform us and the audience how the Hulk did. 
How was uh, Lou Ferrigno? Yeah. It was funny. Uh, you saw his name on like the first episode or two, and then I was like, uh, okay, how's that going to work out? He apparently, there's a character, it's I think that initial scene in The Godfather where, you know, the person comes into his office at his house during the wedding, Mm -hmm. and he like is making, he's asking for a request to a degree. And before he even goes in the room, he's like looking at his cards to practice. So they do this whole storyline. So Lou Ferrigno as whatever his character is actually a mob muscle guy. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the person they've hired for this role has fallen out and they're like, well, we need someone that's 6'6 six, six and really big and whatever. And they all kind of look around and like, well, uh, what about you? Because the mobsters were in and out and sometimes behind the scenes. And it was a little, it was a little, there was, you wonder, I don't know if he found out some of the stuff later of what they were doing because mm. they didn't know all the things that the mob was doing to them or for them at the time at the time so anyway they turn to Lou Frigno and apparently he cannot get this straight these lines he cannot <laughs> they're like trying to like it's like you know 12 words it's like a sentence and a half and it was very challenging so they were like no just do the cards like so they made it sound as if that was a very, that all kind of evolved naturally which was pretty fun right? so funny and then we got, uh, he was uh, your first, uh, besides Giovanni Ribisi, he was like the next mob guy because he was walking him in, he was the muscle. And then eventually you got this other guy, Caesar, who became a real character in it. And, you know, he's kind of going after Juno Temple and he was doing other things. And really, he was ended up being an important uh, character. He was like a second mob type guy. And I didn't, I mean, I found it out kind of in the middle, but Jake Cannavale, Bobby Cannavale's son. Bobby Cannavale's son? Yeah, what? And we also got Michael Gandolfini, who, you know, has a much bigger part in Many Saints of Newark, but, you know. James Gandolfini's son. Yes, mm-hmm. indeed. So there's more crossover to The Sopranos, and there's crossover to other things. There's a lot of, it all is tying together. There's, you know, sons. And- I like the parallel of uh, this series being chock full of awesome people that I would want to watch, referencing the movie being full of people that, oh yeah, that movie was chock full of people. Let's let's load up this TV show full of people. Yeah, so I I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I was also going to say, as far as the episodes uh, and kind of, you know, not directors, but it really, I mean, the first episode, you're like, where are we starting? We're not in Hollywood. And and who, and, and Mario Puzo is writing a book about his mother? Is, is that the Godfather? I don't understand. Oh, it's <laughs> the book before the Godfather. And then we're going to start with writing that book. So, like, it starts way early. That's mainly just the first episode. But it just goes through so much. You get so many sides. You get so many, like, oh, this was happening, and then this was happening, and then this was happening somewhere else, and then this is how that relates. It was it was pretty incredible how much they really crammed in. for. And, you know, I don't think... Well, they, they did were... have 10 episodes. So, they, I mean, still, you're saying a lot of material, but also 10 episodes is a lot of time. Yeah, so... a lot of story, but very enjoyable. And it wasn't like a ton of hour and a half episodes. It was reasonable. But they really got through so much. It was pretty amazing. Uh, maybe I'm more a fan of The Godfather than I was. But, <laughs> well, you uh, know a lot more about it now. I Well, I think I do. <laughs> um, Wait, so. We're not sure how 100% accurate it is, is what you're saying. Yeah, Exhibit B, uh, he did marry this. There's a, the first half of the episodes, he has this girlfriend that's a kind of an important character. And in real life, he actually did marry her. Oh. And she also had two kids from previous. Well, you don't see those kids. They're, they're just two single people hanging out, having a great time. You know, oh. going to New York and coming back. And then <laughs> well, she's going to France. Well, that was what he thought. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but uh, like, what's the time period that we're saying this movie happens during? It's it's like during the pre-production and production of the movie. So it's maybe a year and a half total for this 10 episodes. How many kids are you having in that year and a half? Well, no, I'm saying she had two kids before and then they got married. So he knew what was going on in her life. But yeah, it is, like I said, you really see a lot. I mean, you probably focus on a solid two and a half years okay it's a lot because you really go from way before you know like there the book hasn't even been written and now it's like okay we've optioned the book before it's come out and now we're going all the way through to when the movie actually comes out and there's some post you know what's the reaction what are we doing next you know as i talked about so it's i don't know shockingly i'm saying it's real good (laughs) Well, I don't think that's shocking. I think people liked it, but I mean, it is funny to hear you talk about at length all I know, the that, interesting. That's really the shocking part. But I mean, you know, whatever. I guess apparently I was interested. What platform is it on? Where can you watch this? Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus. Okay, yeah. well, enjoy it. Well, uh, yeah, I did. 
<laughs> <laughs> I would watch that again. I, you know, I'll probably need like two years, but it was it was good. It was enjoyable. Uh, we're definitely gonna. I'm I'm gonna want a check in from you after you watch it again because in the interim. You've already done a whole bunch of research because that's what you do when you get a semi-historical. You're like, well, I need to know what you're fudging with. Um, but I can't imagine you not actually reading the book and watching the movies and then doing the series again. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If I like, because that's, that's part of the problem. We don't have his book, so we don't know what you know has changed of his opinion to television. But I could truly fact check him and just see what other people have said. Like, well, that's not what the production designer said. And that's not what Francis said. So you're full of malarkey. Else yeah. Is lying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I do have one person that I want to ask about the actress who played Ally McGraw. How was she? I love her. She's on my show that I love, Resident Alien. Her name is oh. Meredith Gerritsen. I did. You know, I wanted to mention her. The Ally McGraw thing is crazy because that was uh, apparently Bob Evans was married to her at this time. Oh, married. Mm -hmm. um, but then she, they have not a tiff, but, you know, Bob Evans is on his own train for some parts of this. And she's like, well, maybe I don't want to wait for your next project that you find that's perfect for me. I want to do this other thing that's not even for Paramount. And he's like, well, no, don't do that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just, I've, I can do the uh, impression good in my head when I'm listening to it, <laughs> but not at the moment. Uh, but anyway, so she does this other thing with Steve McQueen, and then seemingly she gets together with Steve McQueen. Uh, oh, sorry, bye bye, Bob. So she's you know sort of a B to C character, mm -hmm. and you really don't see a ton of her. You get as part of uh, Bob Evans' setup, you like you get a lot of like, oh, they're going to parties. This is what he's taking. He's taking her there. He's they're doing this. They're the power couple of Hollywood. Love Story hasn't come out, and then it does come out. That's part of like kind of the one-two punch of Paramount and Bob Evans like getting back on track and recovering to a degree. Uh huh. Because Love Story was humongous. Yes, and I mean, yes, yeah, so those were two quote-unquote big bets on books that you know what they really are doing um, with Colin Hanks and Barry Goodman are they're presenting a very business front of like, well, you Hollywood people, what are you doing? This, why would you do this? This is just a, a love story that doesn't end happily. No. And this book about the mob? But it's not like a crime. You're doing like a series? What are you doing? And, you know, it's long and whatever, you know. So they're constantly like, these are bad choices. And then he ends up being proved right twice in a row. Uh, which is all, that cannot be right. I'm sure Paramount put out another thing. I mean, <laughs> on the other hand, it's not like it is today where, you know, every week we're going to put out something. But yes. So you don't get a ton of her, but she is good. Good for her. And I feel like, you know, especially at the beginning, I mean, it's, I didn't live through Alan McGraw's, you know, 1972, but uh, I'm really, it was like, oh, that seems like it looks like Alan McGraw. Um, so that worked out very well, I thought. Nice. Okay, good. I don't know. I, I could probably say more if you want me to. Uh, no, I think I am sold. I don't I, know if uh, I'll put it on my agenda, but you, I do like the idea of watching it. Are you trying to make an offer we can't refuse? Uh -oh. Uh oh. Oh. I always got to pull in the puns. Come on. Yeah. I might not refuse. I can't decide. I, I feel like I want to watch it, but 10 episodes is a lot, but it sounds really good. What is this like, you know, Liz with uh, Yellowstone, four seasons, you're saying 10 episodes? What? I know. I don't know. No, I probably should watch it. All right. Well, I mean, also, it doesn't sound like anything in, uh, anyone in your family is going to be wanting to watch with you, so you get to watch this on your own. Don't worry about well, it. Well, I do like a solo watch. Yeah. I mean, that's one of my moves. Well, I do, I mean, look, on the other hand, I will say like, oh, well, is it the most high part of, you could have things you're more excited to see. That is absolutely fair. Well. But otherwise, 10 episodes is no big deal. I do have quite an accumulated list of things that I'm supposed to be watching. In my mind, supposed to be watching. You know, you know. since we're still talking about it, I oh, do okay. have to mention <laughs> uh, James Caan, you know, so he's like in Godfather, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but so the guy who plays him, Damien Conrad Davis, doesn't exactly look like him. But somehow, just like the spirit comes out, I really thought he did such an incredible job. And he had like four scenes to work with. He is so fun. Part of what ends up happening with him is they do this scene and you don't understand what's happening. Scene of the television show, not scene in the movie, but it's a dinner and it's like the night before they're going to start shooting or something. And, you know, getting to that point was crazy. And there's a, there's a disaster waiting in the wings that Ruddy is trying to fix and, you know, whatever. But they're doing this dinner 
And what you realize as it starts to happen is they're doing it as the characters. They're doing like a family dinner as the characters with like, you know, the wife. To try and like get it yes. in their heads or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, the daughter who's getting married and like who made the food and like, oh, who should, well, like we should serve the patriarch first and then who goes next. And, like, <laughs> and you're like, what's going on? Why are they like, Did yes, they really Marla- do this? I don't I mean, know. they must have. Exactly. I wish I knew. And you're like, yes, Marlon Brando is important, but this is not how I would imagine this happening. So anyway, he's great in that scene because he's, you know, he's playing Sonny, you know, flying off the handle, but being uh, where he should be. But also like attacking the other guy, like you got to hold him back. It's crazy. (laughs) And then they do this other thing and this, you know, you hope I look, I shouldn't even say it because I don't know if it's true, but. They do this thing where there's a real fight that happens uh, or a fight in The Godfather where James Caan is attacking someone or whatever, beating him up. And they're like, uh, no, that was real. And it was to like avenge a slight that someone else had done on the movie set. And they really let James Caan really go after him. And it was like, what? You barely even see him. You almost see the setup for that. But I don't. It was just another example of like the spirit was there. Just I was like, you don't look like James Caan. Well, so real good job by the casting department. Sounds like or the casting person. Uh, not to mention the casting director, actress who also did a good job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have to look her up because I feel like uh, I I I think she's 25 in real life, and it's like, well, how old was that person in 1972? Because that feels not accurate. But I could be wrong on all counts. Okay, I think we can wrap it up. Unless, John, do you have more people you need to mention from the uh, offer? And then we'd be getting deep. Then it's just like, well, let's just talk about this section. <laughs> we could talk about when they go to Italy. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I do like the idea that it sounds like it was a real mess trying to get it made. And then amazingly, it all sort of still happened. Yeah, I mean, that's the genesis of the whole series is like the amount of challenges and things that went back and forth and problems that got solved by the producer or other people. It's incredible. And you're like, how in the world could this all be true? How could they have had this many? How could they have a problem with every single thing? And that it worked out. Yeah. You're like, well, on the other hand, you're like, well, that's why you didn't want to do Godfather 2, because that was brutal. You were like, never mind. I'm out. Well, very cool. So okay. we're still talking about it. Just kidding. No. <laughs> now you can wrap up. <laughs> okay. So I watched The Gray Man, which is on Netflix. I don't know if it's still in theaters, but it's definitely on Netflix. It was in theaters, and now Netflix for sure is where you can see it. And I also watched the series, I Love That For You, which is eight episodes, and it is on Showtime. And I watched One Up, which is on Amazon. Nice. Okay. And you probably didn't hear me talk about the offer, which is. Oh on wait, what did you watch? The offer. Oh, on, oh, the, oh, the, oh, the offer. The offer. The offer. Okay. The offer on Paramount Plus. Oh, the offer on Paramount Plus. Okay, thank you for that, John. All right, well, thank you for listening. Oh, did you have something more to say? Uh, no, I was going to say you're welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, and one did more you person. You have something else to offer, John? Uh, yeah, I have three more things I need to talk about. About the offer. Let me offer this. I mean, the guy who played Burt Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> was he good? Uh, he was. I mean, the mustache was interesting, but otherwise he was very good. Again, he had like three scenes. But still, I Whatever. mean. Whatever. Spin that off and do a whole series with that guy and uh, Burt doing, you know, uh, Cannonball Run and all and that stuff. And they had a lifetime together. Yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that is interesting. I mean, it's called The Offer and it's season one, so it feels like it might be over, but maybe they'll do more Albert Ruddy stories. No, I, Is that I, his name? Albert Ruddy? Did I just say I, that correctly? Okay. I 100% nice. have your back on that, Catherine. They're, they're going to call it The Offer for season two. And they're going to change the font to match whichever movie it is, because that's what, that's what that's what it looks like right now. The offer is actually all laid out just like the like the Godfather. The Godfather, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, maybe we don't know. Okay, so uh, anyway, back to wrapping it up. Thank you for listening, and you can follow us on all of our social media at Podcast Watching, and we have a Patreon. You can join our Patreon and become a patron and listen to things that we maybe don't like as much as John liked the offer. Okay. Thank you for listening to What What We're We're Watching. Watching.